He's going to have to get you to a place where Jesus is enough. Can you say amen? And that you're not longing for the world. You're not longing to listen to all the wisdom from mankind. Because let me just put this past you. Did you know if you ask any honest scientist, any honest professor, and you ask them, where are we in the universe? They can't tell you. Nobody has the answer. And yet they talk like they do. We know where we came from and we know all that. And yet God said, this is where you came from. I created you in my image after my likeness. You see, science is still searching for God. If they really want to find him. But God is so close, you could fall on him. You see, because God has hidden himself from the wise and the prudent. And revealed himself unto the humble babes. Can you say amen? So it's not our intellectual knowledge. So we put our eyes not on people because they're, they're not always going to give us the right answers. And of course, we get our eyes off ourselves. Why do we get our eyes off ourselves? Because that's where most of the problems come from. It's not the devil. The devil needs you, your flesh, to work one on you. How many is ever, don't raise your hand, been conned, been ripped off one way or another, right? Did you like it? Well, the devil will rip us off every time we allow ourselves to seep into the flesh and think about ourselves. So we know what the answer is. Now, let me ask you this one other truth, and then we'll go through a bunch of them. We're going to have fun today. Say, fun, it's Mother's Day. How does the devil, let me just ask you, how does the devil know when to lay a trip on you? Now, wait a minute, but before you answer, just there's other people here too, okay? How, do you, how does the devil know when you're easy to pick on? What was the answer? He always picks on us. Well, that, yeah, but I'm going to give you a better answer than that. He always picks on you at your weakest moment. He always threatens your strengths, but then turns right around and attacks your weaknesses. What a turkey. Notice when he gives you a bad dream, it's somewhere around two or three in the night when you're asleep. Can't come to you when you're awake. But here, how does the devil know when to attack? Number one, he can hear you speak either positive or negative. Value how you talk during the day. Number two, he picks up on your countenance. The Bible says we have a light that shines on us. In fact, we are creatures of light and we're clothed with the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the armor of light, right? When the light on us begins to dim, we're moving over to the negative and our flesh is beginning to come to the surface and the enemy can see that. He can see the light dims. What's the speed of darkness? It's 186 miles per second when the light switched on. So the idea is when you get with God, switch on the light, so he runs from you. Amen. Amen. You turn off the light in your house, it's all dark. Can you say amen? I used to do experiments by shutting all the lights off in the church. And then, and then I'm, so I'm going to do something. I'm going to ask you to get up and go to the bathroom real quick. People stumbling around the chairs and everything. Of course, I wouldn't let it get out of hand like that because they're having to run by feelings. If you can't see, you have to run by feeling your way around. And that's where Christians have been for a long time. They've not been in the word where the light comes from. The entrance of God's word gives us light. And so what happens, we wander around by our feelings, feeling ourselves around, hoping we're going to run into the great thing. We're not supposed to run on our feelings. We're supposed to run on God by faith. Can you say amen? amen? So God wants us full of light so we can see a long ways off that the enemy is trying to do something. We can deal with them before he camps in your living room. How else can the enemy pick up? He can hear your negative thought. He can see your countenance. He can smell you. Amen. So make sure you got plenty of good stuff. <laughs> What I mean is, whether you know this or not, you can find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, but when we're negative, we put off a smell, okay? And you get around people that are like been under oppression and stuff, and their whole life smells. And I'm not trying to pick on them. 
is because they don't pick up, they don't dump the garbage, and, just, and Satan goes, oh, good, <laughs> I love this kind of stuff. He can smell us. When we're negative, he can smell us. He'll sniff you out. <laughs> Why are you telling me this, Pastor Kurt? I'm just telling you, avoid this at all costs. <laughs> can you say amen? And so he can, God also can smell you. Can you say amen? And the Bible says there's a sweet aroma to those that preach the gospel. And yet, those that consider God a threat, there's an aroma of death too. It's all in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 when Paul talks about his preaching. All right, you ready to get into this? I gave you a little nuggets. The truth about prayer we've been studying. Remember last week we went and we, we snapped off about the spirit, soul, and the body. This is really going to help you in prayer. So after this particular one on prayer, we're also going to cover one more. And I'm going to show you a session where what I do when I meet with God first thing in the morning. Now, only because it's a model, not because I, I've got the perfect formula and you haven't. No. What it is is I'm going to show you what I do with God in the morning. Now, you have your own self. You are you, your own person. So you might do it a little differently, but God gives us some things to cover in the principles of relating to him. How many know if you're going to go flying, you better have wings. There's certain things that God wants us to be aware of that we can work with them when we walk with them. Can you say amen? You got somebody you're walking with that knows no defeat and Satan's absolutely a frightened of him. The only trouble is, he wants you to think you're doing it. You're walking. You're trying to be the good Christian. You're trying to hang on. You're trying to get the decision made. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. God gives you wisdom from above. All right, let's look at this. So good morning to you. Hallelujah. We've been doing a little prayer. This is the third section on prayer itself. From last week, we took a little small break. Now, what happens when you pray? Well, we found out when we first started praying, we prayed, we believed in our heart, confessed with our mouth, and we became saved. So prayer changed our life. Now, if it changed our direction in our life, shouldn't we pray every day and keep the direction going his way? Amen? Amen? But why don't we? I think most of the time Christians suffer because of a lack of prayer, not because their prayers are not being answered. I'm going to show you that in a minute. God answers all of your prayers when they're done according to the word. But when we start asking for selfish reasons, you know, the heavens are going to shut right up and say, I'm not going to bless your flesh. I'm going to bless your spirit, and your spirit in line with me, the blessings will come to your physical area, but I'm not going to bless that rebellious thing called your flesh. You're supposed to crucify it every day. Hello? Amen. Don't go to God and say, hello, God, it's me, Carrie. <laughs> and God says, I thought you died. <laughs> I'm joking with you. Amen? Things to get you to think a little bit more. So our prayer now in the New Testament is completely different than the Old Testament. We pray to the Father in Jesus' name. You see, in the Old Testament, we shared with you, and I'm going to go over it real quickly. In the Old Testament, the answers to prayer had to be fought into the earth. For the reason that who did Adam give this planet to? Satan. And before Jesus came and died and rose again, God's Lord... But the planet belonged to the devil because Adam gave the planet which God gave to him to the devil. So the devil hinders everything that's godly in the Old Testament. So God had to find people who wanted him so he could work with them. He made covenants with them, remember? And remember those covenants, contracts, those agreements were only as strong as the weakest link. And the weakest link is always man. But in the New Testament, there is no weak link. Because Jesus represented man and he died and shed his blood. And the father's never got off the throne. He's always been in charge. And between the father and Jesus representing man and bleeding for us and dying for us. And God, two perfect things made a covenant. And then he says, hey, wake up. 
I have a covenant for you that you, by faith, can get in on. But we have to wake up. And I will propose to you that many Christians are still half asleep. And I don't want to pick on anybody. Because there are things that you haven't discovered yet, yet they're right there in the word that you have to wake up, that the eyes of our understanding have to come to an understanding. Can you say amen? And you're not going to get it all overnight. I wish you could get it all at once, loaded in as a computer program. But God teaches you little by little by little, and he has to have your attention in order to teach you something. Remember Jesus said, if you have ears, let them what? Did you know people suffer with not hearing? They'll hear a sound but not understand what's being spoken. Kind of like a lot of Christians I know. God forbid. They hear, oh, yeah, it's good preaching. What do they preach on? Ay, 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 ay. People came to hear Jesus and they came and they dripped off of every word that he spoke. Knowing that their life was weighed in the balance. Hanging on the words, Almighty God. Is that the way we look at the word? Because the Father is looking for those who hunger for the word, who thirst for the word. He says, this is whom I look. Not to the ones who will build me a church. Not the ones that say they're going to rep represent me. I look to the one with a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. Isaiah 66. In other words, when you pick up your Bible, you're picking up God. And when you read and you pray and submit to God, in the New Testament, you can read the Old Testament too, in the, in the scripture, the Holy Spirit brings it out in, into New Testament understanding. All right, so what do you mean, Pastor Kerry? Well, Jesus said in that day, the day that I go to be with the Father, you shall not ask me anything, but whatever you ask the Father in my name. Do you know why that is? In the New Testament, when you mention the name of Jesus, all heaven stands at attention and is ready at your bidding. What? You're kidding me. No, I'm not. When you say, Father, in Jesus' name, mm. now, what do you want? Don't act like an idiot. <laughs> After you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I can't help it. No, that's your flesh. Why do we bring our flesh to the Lord? Hang it on the meat hook before you go into your prayer closet. Like your jacket, take it off. <laughs> Here, Jesus, I'll lay down myself. There you go. And I come to you with a humble heart. Teach me, change me, help me. God, you know I need it. When you start talking and relating to God that way, watch out what happens. He's going to change it. He's going to bless you beyond your wildest imagination. And there's another thing. Don't let your imagination limit what God can do. All right? So look it. He says in that day. So we're in the New Testament. There isn't any battling answers to prayer down through the atmosphere anymore. Jesus Christ put the devil in his place. He put his foot on his neck. And he says, now the enemy has permission to tempt but he does not have permission to destroy your life. You have to give him that permission. And so you know the rules. I covered this about three weeks ago. That God, because mankind chose to follow something else in the beginning. When God set the earth back up and made Jesus come and rise again from the dead. Now, in order for a person to be saved. Because God died for how many people? Everybody. But how come only a few get saved? Now, does God want everybody saved? Well, why don't everybody get saved? They have to choose. So you know that the rules are set up. You have to call on God. And Satan does everything he can to keep you from that. Ah, you got this. You don't need to pray. You got this. You, you know what's going on. This is your... Not your first whatever. Come on, that's all flesh. God doesn't even like that. Stop trying to promote yourself. So what do we do instead? We humble ourselves and we let Jesus be Lord. Can you say amen? 
All right, so we've been talking about prayer. So in the New Testament, when you say, Father, in Jesus' name, heaven stands. Er, Satan trembles. Now, if you don't know what you're doing, then you're going to bumble on and you're going to... That's why we want you to, to, to be trained a little bit, okay? But God loves us. And so you get a little five-month-year-old child and he's cooing all over in a dirty diaper and comes up to the, the coffee table and pulls the water and the flowers off and everything. And, and you look at that child and you go, oh, isn't she wonderful? That's how God looks at you. You might feel like a big bumble, but he doesn't look at you that way. You look at yourself, and you're not supposed to be looking at yourself. So you got to catch yourself at doing bumbling things. And you got to say, God, help me catch myself. All right. So in our study so far, the Bible says if we abide in him and he ab his words abide in us, what? You shall ask what you desire and it shall be granted you. Hello. When that day, when I go to be with the Lord, you shall ask the Father in my name and he shall give it you. There isn't anything saying I'm going to withhold it because you needed no more wisdom. We keep putting God in a human form, thinking God is going to act like a human father. Huh, he's perfect. He's perfect. He doesn't make a mistake. He doesn't think bad of you at all. Remember Job. God spoke about Job even when Job was in terrible shape. He says, there's none like him in all the earth. Folks, God brags on you. Live up to that standard with God's help. Can you say, man, we do it through prayer. All right, here's a couple of things. What have we learned so far? What have we discovered? What have we found out about prayer? Well, number one, how our Father is eager to have us come to him and fellowship. So he's wondering, what's taking you so long? God is eager. Why? Because he knows when you sit with him, you'll find rest and refreshing. Hello? Christians that are stressed and striving and getting all this kind of stuff, you're not doing one of the things that you need to do. All things through prayer. Hello. Okay. Number two, we should come to him when. What did we learn? First thing, what? Every morning. Don't even think not to. Because it will get finally to a point where your day will not go together at all until you get a chance to get plugged in. How many here have a cell phone? What happens when you don't keep it plugged in? Yeah, you wear out all the energy. Well, the same thing happens to you. If you don't plug in in the morning, then the day that you're living through, going through the day, is going to drain you of everything that you have. And if you put nothing in, it's going to drain you what you thought you had. Because life is taxing. This is a fallen planet. You need God juice. Hello? Plug in in the morning. That's what we found out. And thirdly, we are adjusted when we do that. God adjusts us. He fills our spirit and builds it up. He adjusts our flesh and shuts it down and neutralizes it. He takes our soul and brings it into a rest so it's not flittering around. And we get refreshed, rejuvenated, we start to soak. And then you'll feel God saying, okay, enter your day. And now if you've got an overproductive mind, you'll be thinking, well, I could be there hours. Don't you think God knows your schedule, bunky? <laughs> he can get done in a few minutes what would take you days. Stop thinking about how you're going to do it. Do it! Can you say, hey, man, that's the key. Do it. Don't think about rebuking the devil. Do it. Don't think about this. Do it. Be a doer of the word and not a hearer only deceiving your own self. People, they just hear the word and they shine it on. You're deceived. The Bible says you're deceived already. 
How do I straighten up? Get with God and say, straighten this mess up, God. And then stop talking about yourself in the presence of God so much. You don't want to bore him, do you? All right, moving. <laughs> Come on, laugh with me a little bit. Happy Mother's Day. All right. So we're adjusted. Our spirit man's built up. Amen. Our soul finds refreshing. The fourth thing that we found out is we can come to him boldly without being ashamed. Folks, you might have just blown it. You might have just got mad at your neighbor and you gave him a few choice words. And then you say, oh, Lord, that's not good. You could come right to God and say, God, forgive me of that. I'm sorry. You might have to apologize to your neighbor when that time comes. Who knows? But the idea is God is not looking at you and saying, now you're a bad boy. I'm not going to listen to you. God doesn't say that. When you do something wrong, he wants you to come immediately to him. And let's get it right. How is it that a little baby child can be running around playing, fall into a mud puddle, and what do they do? Do they sit there and splash themselves and say, oh, what was me? Why did I do that? That's what adults do. Duh. Children get up right away, go crying to mama. Mother's Day, we'll just use that prayer. <laughs> Christian, when you make a mistake, get up right away and go to God. Don't sit around and go, why did I do that? That's a terrible. And then the devil comes by and he's got a pocket full of guilt. Listen. You're going to bumble and stumble as long as you're in your body. That's why you take your body and put it on the altar as a living sacrifice. And don't bother to pick it up. Don't talk about yourself throughout the day. Don't brag. Don't try to manipulate the will of God and get it done quicker. Because when you do that, you're going to break something in your life. Now, it'll get fixed, but you'll find yourself more stressed than blessed. You like that? Say, not stressed, but blessed. Fifth thing. Besides coming to God, the fourth thing, unashamed, without guilt because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Fifth thing is our prayers are based on his word, not our emotion. Let me tell you a quick story. I was praying. I had two children. I had a full-time job. And I'm a full-time pastor. What did I need? Rest. And I was talking to God, going, God, you know, here I am. And I'm just listing all the complaints. Oh, God, is that, this is not coming again. Oh, and then God interrupts me. And the first feeling I had is, what do you want, God? I'm praying. Come on, we can laugh at ourselves. I said, Lord, what do you want? I'm praying. I'm praying to him. He says, what are you doing? Remember, God speaks to us. He said, Adam, where are you? You know, to, what was it, um, uh, Haggai. He says, why are you out here, you know? Hello. He says, what are you doing, Carrie? I said, I'm praying, Lord. He says, no, you're not. And then you know what I did? I started arguing with him. Oh, yes, I am. I'm, I'm pissed. He says, no, you're not. He says, oh, yes, I am. No, you're not. I said, well, what am I doing then? I'm just hamming it up for you, so okay. He says, you're complaining. I already know the mess you're in. Speak my word. That's what I answer. Speak my word. Speak my word. I answer my word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God and the word was speak the word because you're speaking God and when you're speaking God God cannot say no to himself so don't pray your head don't tell God what you feel he knows he can feel it with you when you sit down and you eat he tastes the food with you that's how close you are and somebody's taught you some religious garbage, you think that God will leave you sometime when you mess up. He never leaves us. The key is, is you've got to re-educate your thinking because you've been given a bad route. It's not correct. 
So you say, God, help root out of my thinking things that I don't need to be floating through there. Root it out so I have a great picture of who you are and how you love me. Say amen. amen. Sixthly, God's prayers are sealed in Jesus' name. Hello. So our prayers, they need to be based on the word. We petition God, your word says, your word said, and I believe I receive it, your word says. So our prayers are sealed in an everlasting covenant. Say everlasting covenant. Let me explain this, and I'm going to take a minute to explain, okay? Now, back in the Old Testament, when, it, when a contract, which is also called a covenant, which also is called a testament, they're all basically the same word. Like, say, for example, my nephew... Him and I make a contract that we're going to go get this car and we're going to fix it up, sell it, and share the profits. And then, of course, something gets to work and then things kind of go sideways and everything like that because the contract must be obeyed, see. But the problem is, mankind, we're the weak member. How many's ever seen a chain link? And then when you put the tautness of a chain link on it, pulling as much as you can from both ends... What's, finally, it's going to be pulled so much that something is going to break, right? And it's going to usually be the weakest link, the one that's the weakest. So the covenant that we've had in the Old Testament is like a chain link. When Satan puts the pressure on us, the weak link is going to crumble. Man is going to fall short. So that's why in the New Testament, it's founded on better promises, on a better system. Why? Because Jesus represented man. He died. He bled. He did everything. And the father, who can't bleed, came and they made a contract. Now, what's unusual about this contract is it cannot be broken by any man. Man didn't make it, so man cannot break it. God the Father, and God the Son, Jesus coming as a man, dying as a man, rising as a man, sealed the covenant, and now two immutable things have sealed the covenant, and God says, and I said this a little earlier, but I'll say it again, we have to wake up that that covenant exists, and the power of that covenant, so when we base our prayers, we don't base them on our emotions or our feelings, we base them on the covenant that Jesus Christ made with his father and that only. And where there is no weak link. Can you say amen? amen? So when you say father in Jesus name, all of heaven stands. Not because you're so special. It's because your faith is in a covenant that all of heaven will respect and follow. So when you say father in the name of Jesus, you're saying, I believe in that covenant. I believe that I'm a child of God and I believe my prayers will be answered. So when you say, Father, blah, 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 in Jesus' name, amen. you'll understand how powerful that is. Say amen. amen. So they're sealed in an everlasting covenant. Seven, we found out that we, when we pray, we are cloaked with God. Folks, I don't know about you, but I don't know where the devil can get in on somebody. But I used to believe when I was younger that the devil could listen in on my prayers to God. They could follow in, sit over there on the couch, and while I'm praying to God, he's listening in. You know, I can't find that anywhere in the Word. In fact, I found out that when I come in the Spirit, when I walk in the Spirit, when I come to God in the Spirit, Satan can't follow He's sealed out of the secret place, out of the spirit realm. So if you feel under the weather today, you should be praying. Get into that secret place where Satan can't harass your mind and get readjusted. Amen. Don't sit around feeling pain and shoving down pills. Go ahead. Get in and get adjusted too. Yeah. With that. Amen. Say Amen. Thank you, sister. You got amens. For, <laughs> just, I love amens because it kind of kind of gets you on. So we found out that we pray we're cloaked with God. We are cloaked with the armor of light. Light chases away darkness. When you fight the enemy in your prayer closet, 
You fight him by projecting Jesus through the word of God. You don't fight him, as Paul says, one that beats the air. Oh, I'm fighting the devil. Yeah, you are. You're wearing yourself out, boo-boo. You don't fight the devil that way. You just lift up your hands and say, Father, the enemy is coming against me. So now I project God out of me, Father. And Jesus, you already smashed that man, that ugly thing. And so now I release him to do the same. And I thank you in Jesus' name and start just praising the Lord. See, because you don't do the fighting. The one who won fights for you. But you got to bring him out instead of threatening the devil with yourself. Satan's not afraid of you. He's afraid of the God you have in you. And way, you be careful. Don't you let Jesus take over your life because you can have life and have it more abundantly. It's all a game to the devil to keep you from what God has already given you and from waking up to what the reality God has made yours. I don't preach myself happy. Hallelujah. So let's go on. We found out that we're cloaked. Eight. We found out that we are to pray about everything before anxiety gets us. Folks, Satan makes you worry. Worry is meditating on false facts. Fear is false what? Okay, false evidence, evidence appearing, appearing real. He, he gives you a thought and says, ooh, you got to do this. You better do it right away. No, you're going to stop for a second and pray. God, you see, you bring God in. On everything. So, Without prayer, you have a tendency to catch anxiety. How many know Jesus says, and take no anxious thought for what you shall wear or what you shall eat or what you shall put on. For all these things the Gentiles worry about and you're saved. You don't have to worry about those things. Are you saying I don't have to work? No. Are you saying I could be just lazy for Jesus? No. What I'm saying is, is when you work, you work with God. Not work in your own power. So when you work with God, you work at rest. Here you are doing a job and you've got joy and rest and all that's going on. I remember I fought a forest fire in eastern Washington. I was surrounded by the devil. The devil even threatened me when we got off the bus. And you know what? I just kept on focusing on God and praying to God like he asked me to do. And he filled me and pressurized me for that particular assignment like forest fires. And not only that, but 30 people got saved. Not all at once. God took me. We were there two weeks. He took me every day through an adventure to meet somebody new, to share somebody about my testimony in the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? People that were away from the Lord came back. Our bus driver backslidden assembly God he heard me talking to another person about Jesus and he stopped the bus when everybody got off to do their laundry he says would you pray for me I've been away from the Lord I said absolutely and then down on that but we got so dirty and so filthy with the soot and everything we went down the lake to kind of wash you know not in the nude or anything but walk down and everything bunch of guys and, and, and everybody were down there and I got to preach So getting on the bus after the guy returns his life back to the Lord and two or three people ask me, what must I do to have the joy that you have? Now remember, I'm not putting any of this on. I'm not trying to be this way. This is something that you and I are in Christ when we keep him as the main focus, amen, as we keep our hearts from complaining about life and start praising, start blessing people. Find out some things about somebody. Maybe you don't understand them a whole lot. Maybe they look nice. Tell them they look nice. Start passing around blessings to people and stop thinking about, oh, poor me. Listen, I used to think when you stuck your lip out hard enough, people will pay attention to you. 
and I'm not picking on it. <coughs> I'm not picking on any of it, but think about it. I remember, I have this memory. I can remember when I was real, real young. Mom and dad take me to the store, and if I saw something I liked, I'd throw a fit. Listen, don't be that way with God. You don't have to throw a fit. Don't throw a fit at the devil. Don't throw a fit at life. Certainly don't throw a fit at your, your spouse. Don't throw a fit about yourself. Don't sit around and talk down on yourself. Have a party about Jesus. Amen. Get your thoughts away from your pains and your sorrows. Because you can't really do a whole lot. You're doing what you can do. And then turn the rest of your attention on God and let him take up where the slack needs to be taken up. Can you say Amen. All right, so we found out that we, who the unjust judge was. Can you tell me who the unjust judge was? Life itself doesn't know any difference between God, the devil. Life will deal with you whatever it deals. But if you know how to pray, you can change the circumstances of the day. We also found out who was the friend at midnight. Who was the friend at midnight? Remember the guy went and he said, give me three loaves, but it was midnight and he was asleep. He said, leave me alone, blah, 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 blah. Who was that friend that the guy couldn't get up? What? Your flesh. When, when you know you should pray and your flesh says, yeah. No, I'm not saying necessarily like that. But your flesh doesn't want to pray. It doesn't want to read its Bible. It doesn't want to, because it says it uses these words. He doesn't want to play church. Yeah. It doesn't want to behave. That's your flesh. That's not, did you know? I, I think you do. You're not taking that flesh with you to heaven. That bod you got there you're sitting with. I'm going to say bod. But sometimes it's just a big blob. I'm talking about myself now. We're not going to take this. This is not going. So why are we paying so much attention to it? Why are we investing so much of our thoughts into ourselves? It's a deception. Because the Bible says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, we which, we will be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. In a moment, in a twinkling, you'll be changed. This corruption will put on any corruption. You're not going to take this body with you. So bathe it, feed it, give it what it needs, but don't give it anything more because it's a little monster. Read, read the Bible. The Bible says you are the one you should fear. The Bible says don't fear the one that can cast you into hell. He says, don't fear the one who destroy your body. Don't fear the one, but only the one that can cast your soul into hell. Now, who is that? Well, God doesn't cast anybody into hell because it's a choice we make. Satan doesn't throw anybody into hell because he hasn't got the power to. He just talks them into it. But the person you need to be very, very respectful for is yourself. Without God, you are a tyrant and you are going to go to hell without God. So don't trust yourself. He's saying, don't fear the one who will destroy your soul. That's your flesh. Not the devil. He can't do it without you. I was sharing with Peggy. I don't know. Peggy, can I share this? Did you know I'm going to say something to you? And I hope you will look through scripture and see if I'm right. But none of us comes up with any kind of ideas on our own. Amen. You have not thought of anything on your own. Amen. Although the enemy makes us feel like we do. Sometimes we feel like we do. Now you have to play this out what I'm telling you. I'm not saying this lightly or heartedly. I'm saying that... We've had two influences all through our life. We've actually had more, but they either play on one side or the other. We know we have God influence, say amen. And we have the other influence, right? 
Okay, so how do we play this thing? How do, how do we understand this thing? Well, first of all, everything that God says to you is going to bless you. It's going to build you up. It's good. It's perfect. Okay? So I think that's pretty descriptive. So anything that's iffy, challenging, painful, hurt, all that negative stuff, where would that be from? Okay. So... Let's look at the world. Every invention that was ever done or created that's helped mankind was done by God suggesting it to a believer. You can check it out for yourself. Nobody's ever helped mankind except for those that love God because God helps mankind. So every good invention, every good thought, every good action is inspired by God. You didn't come up on it on your own. Have you got that? Yeah. Then the negative in your life, like you can't go without that. and You're going to need this and all that. You can see what the negative is doing. Oh, Pastor Gary don't love you anymore, you know. He's going to get a mad because you're staring at the phone all the time. You know, whatever. It doesn't really matter. The idea, you see, is you're playing between two, but you don't come up with ideas on your own. They're inspired by God or they're retired by the enemy. Amen. Do you have tired thoughts, wore out thoughts? You know where they're coming from. Also, I'm going to speak to you because I know you guys are watching is that don't let the devil play you. He's saying, oh, you went and got a shot, so now you're sick. You went and did this, you went and did... Don't let him play fear games with you. You rebuke him in the name of Jesus. I'm talking right to you. You can see me. Rebuke him in the name of Jesus because you've got Almighty God living in you. Focus back on the Lord and start praising him and get in the word. There's an old lie going around that if you've taken the shot, you don't know what you're getting. And so people who have problems with fear, they'll start believing for the negative. Who's doing that? Listen, the Bible says, whatever you do, word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord. So take the medicine in the name of the Lord. Yeah. And rebuke any reactions to it. Amen. Remember, God is greater than medicine. Take God with your medicine. Yes. In Jesus' name. I do. My blood sugars have been wonderful, but because of God, not because of my medicine. Oh, God, well, I'm going to only use you on a Sunday, but the rest of the week, oh, I'm on my own. All right, moving right along. We found out. Who these two people were, unjust judge and that. But next thing is, we found out the more exposure to God you and I have in our time with him, the more like him we become. Boy, are you tired of yourself yet? Maybe you should spend more time with God. <laughs> Just came to me. Why? Because he gives us peace when there's torment. He gives us rest when we seem agitated. He gives us joy when things seem uptight. That's why we need him so much. That's why we need to stay open to him. That's why we are a continual receiver of God. You have a radio receiver? You want to hear music? You got to turn it on the station. You want to hear God bring you and do miracles in your life? You got to stay plugged into his station and hear his words of encouragement and his songs as he sings over you instead of all the jibby jabby what's going on that you pay so much attention and repeat say not me <laughs> all right so the more ex exposure to God amen and then finally, 11, there's a place that you and I can go and dwell where the enemy can't even get near. What is that place? It's called the secret place. The secret place. It's the place of the spirit realm. Now, remember, there's two of you. There's the old you. You bring it along every once in a while, but don't show it off. <laughs> 
and the new you. Can you say amen? This childlike and free and ready to go. So which one are you living? You live in the free one. Can you say amen? You're like a child. God says so is the kingdom of God as such as a ch little children. Come innocently. Come forgetting about yourself. Focus on me. I have a life and a way to, for you to live that goes beyond the limitations of your thoughts. Amen. Can we trust him for it? Yes. All right, finishing with you. Spend the time needed to cover your needs. Matthew, we know, 6.6 6 says, But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and meet with your Father in the secret place. And he that sees you in the secret place, our Heavenly Father, will reward you while you live throughout the day openly. People will see you've been a man or a woman of prayer because you're stable. Matthew 6, further on, it says, Therefore, do not be like the hypocrites, for your Father knows what you have need of. This is verse, Matthew 6, verse 8 through 15. Follow along. This is the Lord's Prayer, and I'm going to be simple with it. I noticed two weeks ago when I went through it, I went so fast, sometimes I didn't emphasize the point, so I don't want to go too fast. And it says, For your Father knows what things that you have need of. In this manner, this way, Cover these things when you pray. Say to him, our Father which is in heaven, in Jesus' name, New Testament, hallowed be your name. Basically what you're saying is, God, you're perfect, you're just, you're holy. And the idea behind that is so you get so caught up in telling him how wonderful he is, you forget about yourself. God is then able to take you and move you into the spirit realm where you can begin to cover the other areas and so these other areas are okay after you hallowed the Lord you make him feel special he's the best thing in your life okay all right then you say your kingdom come your will be done in Jesus name what's it like in heaven that's how God wants it done in the earth you sick God wants you well he doesn't want you just healed you see, here's what happens. You know, we get sick, then we get healed. That's the least. Better, wouldn't it be better for you to have divine health yes. than to get sick and healed, sick and healed, sick and healed? And wouldn't it be better to, from the sick and healed to be in divine health, but wouldn't it even be better to walk in divine life? You see, we graduate out of ourselves by following Jesus and we enter into a new and better way in Christ. You see, where we're not always on my mind. I'm my own best friend. <laughs> Hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. How many know that God provided manna every day for the Israelites? That's what he's saying. Give me what I need daily. Because if I hoard up all the blessings, they're going to rot. Hello, have you got a closet full of clothes you don't wear anymore? What's it there for? It reminds you? How little you used to be or how big you used to be. I don't know. Hello. We don't see them as seeds. We just see them as clothes. There are all kinds of seeds that you have anyway. Let's move on past that. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Basically, a trespass is when you offend somebody. It doesn't mean just sin. It means trespass. For example, if I say something that offends my nephew personally, I trespassed him. Another trespass people don't know is when you take matters in your own hand, you're trespassing against God. He wants to work it out for you, but you've got to work it out for him. Stop it. It's so ridiculous. God, I'm working really hard. I could just hear God saying to me, you know, I'm working really hard and sweat's coming down my head. And God says, bing, Carrie, what are you doing? I'm working really hard. And he says, yeah, you're about ready to kill yourself. Yes. 
And so sometimes we got to feel, feel sorry that we allow this to go on in our life. That's where repentance comes. It, it softens our heart and flesh. Are you still with me? Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. He used the term, not besides trespass, but he used the word debts. How many here have ever had a debt you wanted to make up on? You didn't want to make it better. How many here know you had a debt and you were sentenced to hell and God forgave you of that debt and accepts you as his own? Amen. So when we go to God and we say, Lord, forgive us our debts, that means forgive us our daily trespasses, the little things that get in the way of a relationship with God. As we forgive those that trespass against us. Have you ever had somebody trespass against you? And so what did you do? You forgave them instantly? No, you talked about them. Put them all over the internet. How bad they are. That's pretty dumb. Because as you sow, you're going to get all that back on you. Best to just forgive and let it go. And say, God, you work out the details because you know that offended me. And leave it at that. Moving right along. And as we forgive our debtors, then it says, lead us not into temptation, testing and trial. In other words, you should say, in Jesus' name, don't let me get in the flesh. Because the moment you get in the flesh, you're open for temptation. Jesus said to his disciples, you pray with me one hour. Then when he went away and he came back, they were asleep. He says, your flesh is weak, but your spirit is willing. Couldn't you watch with me one hour? So, Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive those that are dead. And lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. Everyone say amen. amen. So, deliverance from the evil one means that you're not going to hear his lies. You're not going to hear his negative suggestions to you. You're not going to get caught up in the world's ways getting all frustrated with anger, trying to make deals and doing all that because Satan just has a heyday with that. Hello? He does. He has a heyday. Rather than you go to God and say, God, give me the, your plan for the day. Order my steps on the way. And you know what's neat about God is he always has you on his mind. God always has you on his mind. Now let me ask you, do you always have him on your mind? No, you're working on it. Let's be honest. But you are always on his mind. In fact, every one of you are so precious to God, he's all, you are on his mind. Well, how can God think of us all so personally one-on-one? -on -one? I told you that. He's God. He can be so vast, so powerful, and yet so personal. Take the personal part and develop a great relationship with him. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Don't. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one or the evil one's effects. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In other words, why is that in there? It's in there to make sure God always gets the credit. For answering all those prayers, covering all that area, and working your life out, God gets the glory, God's kingdom, God's power, and it's forever and ever. And don't you think anything differently? That's what that's in there for. It isn't your rodeo. It isn't your parade. It isn't your elevator that misses the top floor. It is God's. So get in his elevator and let him take you to a new point of view. Let him raise you up into his area and let you see the way he sees things. You'll find yourself not caught up so much in being offended and finishing. Did you get anything out of this? Ephesians 6 tells us about the armor of God. Now, two weeks ago, I covered a little bit about the armor of God. We found out that when we pray, Father, in Jesus' name, we're covered with the armor, aren't we? And the thing I want to say, because we don't have enough time today, but is every piece of that armor is Jesus. Who's the helmet of your salvation? Who's the breastplate of righteousness? Jesus. Who's the faith, taking the shield of 
faith whereby you show what? Quench all the fiery darts. Of the... Did you know your faith is a shield? So that's why God says when you approach me, approach me in faith, you're shielded. Approach me in faith, you're shielded. Approach me by works and I will not receive you. I'll love you, but I won't receive the work because we are a fallen creature and the works that we do are fallen. So even on the best of your days, if you don't have Jesus in it, you're playing the guitar or beating the drums or writing the poetry or writing whatever the deal is, is not going to mount to boohoo until you get God involved in it. And then look out. And really get blessed. Things go better with Jesus Christ. Things go better with him. Amen. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a little bit joyous here. Because man, I tell you, when you preach and share the truth, I mean, God just loves the fact that he wants his people to know about him. My goodness, he wants us to know that he's wonderful. I just love this. So we're covered when we're pray. we pray. Can you say amen? So, folks, that's one of the things you should be doing the most. More than any other thing, spending the time with God because you're the one that's missing out. Lots of things, just like I am. And the only way I can get them, I'm not going to come up with them on my own, is get in and get God's mind on the deal. And so he cloaks us. Now, folks, the cloaking of the armor is because there's a spiritual outlaw in this planet. He doesn't want you to succeed. So God cloaks you, protects you, but you've got to be aware of it so that you can wear it. You've got to be aware of the power before you could use it. You've got to be aware of the tool before you could understand it. And so God gives us his word for us to study he gives us his time for us to pray and to be with him so that we can become whole. We're not whole. And the only way that we come real close to being whole is that time we spend with God first thing every day. The most mature you and I ever get is we don't grow one day and become mature. No, we grow and become seasoned. But maturity comes by letting God fully control your life. Because he's the only perfect, perfect one we know. And finally finishing this very thing. So, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5, as I read it to you. For though we walk in the flesh, in other words, though we be physical, we don't fight the enemy from our physical flesh. Hello. For the weapons of our warfare are not natural are not fleshy. We don't fight as one beats the air, but they're mighty through, see the word through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. Satan's worked all your life to put strongholds and little what I call hot buttons in you. And everything will be just fine until somebody hits your hot button. Husband and wife, you have hot buttons and off buttons with guys. Ladies, don't be a nag. Because the moment you start nagging, you'll hit the off button. And the guy won't hear you anymore. Hello? So you be careful of the buttons that you hit. Make sure they're God buttons. Can you say amen? amen? Understand a little bit more about yourself. Don't run around just because you've been a Christian for a length of time. Running around like you got it together. No, don't do that. It's not humble. Even though you might know the, more than the average Christian, do not present yourself that way. Make yourself of no reputation and take on the form of a servant. Why? Because God always exalts the humble, but he brings low the proud. So, Get rid of yourself every time you meet with God in the morning. Lord, I'm coming to get rid of myself. And God says, good. Amen. Can you laugh with me? Can you see the humor in that? And yet we think we've got it together. We're going to run our life. 
No, 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 no. That's what Cain did. Look what, he, look what happened to him. He killed his brother. People who walk in the flesh for God walk out their salvation in the flesh, in the physical realm, not letting God do his job, will kill other people and not know they will. They'll hurt them, they'll beat them, they won't get their way. They'll try to manipulate people in the church. We don't want any of that. Say amen. So the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God. Pull down the strongholds that are in your mind that tell you you're never going to be anything. You got this, and so you're going to always have to suffer that. And you did this, you never made the right choice. You were divorced, and now you're remarried, and you're never going to be blah, 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 blah. Where does that stuff come from? It doesn't come from God. Because God, no matter how bad you were, is never going to bring up your past. He's going to bring up hope and his word, and then he's going to say, I'll be right there with you to help work it out. If you got something out of that this morning, would you give the Lord a praise?